Welcome back to the AI Academy. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Rita Vecina. Dr. Vecina is both a DVM and a PhD credential holder. She trained at the University of Milan and currently is the scientific director for the UGIN programs in Spain. And she'll be discussing a stimulation protocol. Her group has published on this topic. And this will be a shift a little bit in our program from embryology-based tools looking at clinical aspects of AI and how it can improve our clinical care. We we'll look forward to your comments. Dr. Vasina. thanks so much for participating. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rita Vasena, and today I'm going to talk about the use of artificial intelligence and specifically machine learning uh, in order to predict the best initial dose of FSH for controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. Uh, first, just a few words about machine learning, uh, which is uh, uh, a type of AI that automates the writing of task rules that are necessary to complete an action. In a classical um, machine learning uh, setup, the dates are first inputted with results so that the uh, machine learns the relationship between the two sets, the data that are uh, inputted first and the results that are related to this data. And by finding this relationship, um, there is a writing of rules uh, which turns out to be models of machine learning. Once this process of training is completed, then the computer is ready to receive just the input rate data without any results, and then is able to assign and or predict the results according to the rules that I've learned. Um, there are several advantages in the use of machine learning. Uh, one of them, very obviously, is that these systems are capable of detecting certain patterns that are usually unknown or they can be unknown or relationships that uh, might have escaped um, the professional and they are present in our data. However, it's important to always remember that uh, uh, machine learning algorithms are not experts and therefore the rules, uh, as much as they may make, make sense if we look at the association, they may have no medical or biological basis. And here comes the issue or the concept of explainability. It's always important that we know how to explain these models in terms of how they work to make sure that the, there is no faulty uh, rules and then this uh, um, algorithm can be uh, applied safely. You probably have seen, uh, if you work in IVF, that there have been in the last few years uh, an acceleration in the number of companies dealing with uh, artificial intelligence that are poised uh, to enter our clinics and especially our laboratory. And I'm sure he has not escaped you. Uh, the most of these companies, they rely on images. And this is not by chance. In fact, uh, until very recently, um, images and, and tools uh, to analyze images uh, were the most uh, uh, preponderant in the artificial intelligence scientific literature. So there's where uh, most of the knowledge and most of the professionals were, were, uh, were trained to. Um, in our case, uh, if we look at in general how uh, assisted reproduction cycles are managed, uh, we can see and we can say that there are several aspects of this management that are more or less empirical. And I mean it in the best possible sense of the word. Um, in fact, we have uh, uh, very decent chances of access and we achieve them by a mixture of uh, external knowledge, which uh, usually people uh, receive through training and schooling, and internal um, knowledge that is usually through direct experience of, of uh, health professionals. However, there are some moments or some situation in which this external or internal knowledge uh, is not sufficient. And, uh, and then there are areas of improvement in these points. Uh, for instance, when there are rare clinical cases uh, by which the, both the external and the internal um, knowledge is not, is not sufficient just because they're so unusual that there's not enough knowledge on them, 
or if uh, there, are, there is uh, an incorporation or an onboarding of professional, uh, they have less experience or they are uh, just out of training or, or, or younger in their uh, professional trajectory. In this sense, the internal knowledge is the one that is uh, usually lacking the most. Or sometimes uh, there is uncertainty in the published literature, so the both training and direct experience um, are not really able uh, to understand what are the best decisions to be taken in certain situations. So in these cases, uh, alg machine learning algorithm can, in fact, provide a standardization of decision which will reflect overall in either an improvement of clinical results or a reduction of the risks that may be associated with the clinical procedure. In, in our cases, in the Eugene group, we have recognized uh, this possibility already a few years ago, and we have developed a, a data team that is solely responsible to develop uh, uh, solutions that are based on complex uh, uh, databases and, and uh, algorithm analysis. Um, and the, the way that we have uh, thought about it is to gather a number of uh, priority for our clinician and our patient. And one of them that I would like to focus on today is, is try to answer this question. Is it possible to accurately identify the optimal dose of, of FSH for all patients uh, in cycle of control ovarian stimulation using uh, these machine learning models? Uh, we decided to focus on this uh, question because uh, we know that the chance of pregnancy does increase with the number of embryos that are available for embryo transfer. And this number of embryo uh, is tied in its relationship and it does increase together with the number of M2 that are collected from the ovaries and the number of M2 that are collected from the ovary uh, itself is optimized with an appropriate stimulation of each patient. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, this is not a very original question or an original doubt. In fact, there are published nomograms that are used or can be used to determine the initial dose of FSH. Here you have two examples and, uh, and they work, uh, they're relatively simple in their structure and they work very nicely. Um, the only problem or the only limitation of this nomogram is that they tend to be developed only for normal ovulatory patients and for those that are under the age of 40. Uh, leaving out uh, the more complex cases where perhaps we could actually take advantage of an appropriate nomogram. So uh, we wanted to be able to predict the optimal initial FSH dose for each patient, for everyone, regardless of age or type of cycle. And in doing so, we have prepared uh, a large data set uh, that we divided in two. Uh, we have about 3,000 cases that are used for the development of our algorithm and another uh, about uh, almost 800 that are used uh, after the training for the validation um, of the algorithm performance. And when we compare, you will see that I will show it in a moment, when we compare the algorithm to clinicians, uh, we refer to uh, about a pool of about 35 doctors with on average 12 years of experience in assisted reproduction and with a pretty wide range. Some of them are uh, absolutely extremely um, well-trained and, and experienced. So in order to um, plot and, and, and uh, predict uh, the best FSH, initial FSH dose, we have developed, uh, we have assigned uh, a new variable called the sensibility. And the ovarian sensibility is defined by the number of uh, mature oocytes that are collected from an ovary over the dose of FSH that has been used. And this uh, sensibility, which is individually specific for each patient, is the variable that we have asked our algorithm to predict. And the output of it is um, the dose of FSH, which uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, calculated according to the sensibility on one end, but also it needs to be within a certain target that we can decide. Uh, and so we can adjust uh, uh, the prediction depending on the amount of M2 that we want to achieve. And all this, I have to say, is always uh, taking into consideration the constraint given by the ovarian reserve of our patients. 
So in order to describe this uh, graphically, the optimal dose of FSH would uh, have a, a score of zero. And then uh, if the uh, dose was uh, that, that is given is too high, so it would have reached the same number of M2 with, with less, um, then the score of this dose will uh, shift towards uh, the plus one. And if the dose that was given is too low, it will shift towards the minus one. And since we can decide uh, how the, the range of M2 that we want to achieve and also the range of uh, uh, FSH in which we want to move. Uh, as an example, and for the rest of the presentation, I would say that the goal uh, is to have between 10 and 15 M2s uh, and given uh, the algorithm, the constraints to stay between 100 and 300 um, international units of, of FSH as a starting dose. And I'm very much aware that these doses are uh, more uh, resounding for uh, European practices. I know that uh, in North America, doses tend to be higher. But like I said, uh, uh, this can be adjusted and it's part of the information that are given the algorithm. So with this constraint, then we are asking the algorithm is this uh, are, are the oocyte in the target range? So are we getting with the dose uh, this amount of oocyte? And we compare what does the clinician uh, prescribe and what the algorithm uh, prescribes. So um, in order to design this algorithm, we need to reproduce uh, uh, correctly the dose response function between FSH and number of M2 of each patient. So the real function, uh, it looks a little bit like this, it's a bit of a sigmoid curve, and you can easily understand why. You have a, a range of FSH that uh, increases little by little and the ovary does not respond, and then you enter uh, into a range of doses by which for every uh, small increase in FSH dose, the ovary responds by recruiting follicle, and so you have a, a very quick rise in number of M2, and then you get to a point where the limitation of the ovarian reserve uh, kicks in, and so if you increase FSH past a certain point, you actually reach a plateau in M2 because there are no more uh, available follicles for recruitment. In order to be able to uh, um, plot this type of uh, a dose response function in, in real life for each patient, we should be able to have, uh, at least in a training set, a number of cases where a very different amount of FSH were given repeatedly in different cycles to the same uh, person or to person with the same characteristic. And this is uh, almost never happening actually in our clinic. And so we decided to approximate um, to a, a line. And therefore, what we just wanted to uh, identify is the, is the slope of this, uh, of this line. And this would be uh, what we want to predict. Now, there is a, an issue again with how do you plot the slope because for every rect there are, you know, you need two points in order to define um, the linear function. So one point, of course, is the one that we have in the database, the amount of SHA, FSH that was given to a certain person and the M2 um, that were obtained. And the other one we chose uh, to use um, the number of M2 that would have been collected in case the FSH, the uh, exogenous dose of FSH were zero. And we decided to assign uh, this M2 number uh, as zero. And uh, you may argue uh, rightfully uh, that uh, if you don't add any external FSH, you may still ovulate. So this number of M2 will not be completely zero because there is endogenous, M2, uh, endogenous FSH. However, we approximated this to zero because otherwise in certain patients with very low response, we may find ourselves with a negative slope, which will kind of invalidate the whole exercise. So, um, this is uh, the type of uh, um, a dosage that have been prescribed by clinician, this pool of 35 clinician for these are real cases, um, depending on uh, um, the range of uh, oocyte that have been collected. As you can appreciate in the 10 to 15 range, uh, the majority of uh, clinician has uh, um, have uh, uh, prescribed between 250 and 300. Um, international unit. Uh, however, there is uh, about 15% of uh, clinicians that have prescribed um, less than 200 units. Now, this same, uh, uh, this same patient have been also 
uh, analyzed by the algorithm, and this is uh, what we found. So you can just by by a bird eye view, you can notice that the algorithm basically never uh, uh, never suggests to um, administer uh, less than 150 international unit, and in general, it tends to overdose, so to speak, compared to clinician. And uh, I think this is uh, perhaps related to the fact that the clinician have a patient in front of them, so they tend to be perhaps more uh, conservative in the doses that they have, because then they will have to deal, of course, with the consequences of their, um, of their uh, prescription. Um, so this is all uh, well and, and, and fine, however, uh, you know, further to these graphs and, and this dosage, the real question that we, that we want to ask and the real reason why we may implement an algorithm of this kind would be, if, is this actually useful in clinical practice? Does it actually change how we do things? Does it improve it? And, uh, and so we, we have uh, uh, looked at it. Uh, so we found that uh, there is an effectivity score that is uh, uh, smaller for the algorithm than for clini clinician and this is in fact uh, a positive uh, situation if we translate this into a visual uh, representation we can consider the effectivity score the dispersion of the doses around the optimum and uh, while clinician has the dispersion in 0 0.16 the algorithm would narrow it closer to the optimal dose if we go and uh, look at what does it mean in terms of patient treated, well, we see that of the 774 patients that have been uh, uh, treated uh, with, the, with the dose that uh, has been prescribed by the clinician, um, a, a high percentage, 531, they were in the optimal dose range in order to achieve this 10 to 15, um, 10 to 15 M2. And then uh, about uh, um, 160 uh, were given a dose that it was too low, so they didn't reach the optimal range. And uh, 69, they were given a dose that is too high, and so they um, went over uh, the, necess the necessary dose in order to reach the optimal range. Now, what happened when you uh, apply the algorithm and, uh, and uh, you know, what happened to these uh, uh, proportions? So when you apply the algorithm, you gain patients that are given the optimal dose. You go from 531 to 634, so there is a significant increase. There is a, a very significant decrease of patients that are given too low of a dose of FSH, which is expected given uh, the graph that I showed you before. Um, however, as you can see, there is an increase from 69 to, to 83 of patients that are given a, a dose that is too high, so the algorithm overdoses, so to speak, um, a little bit more patient than the clinician do. So how does this translate into practice? So um, we have seen that there were five patients that had already between 10 and 12 M2s, they were given more than 100 international units of extra FSH over what they needed to reach uh, the range, the appropriate range. This is uh, uh, 0.6 of the total, and we consider that this may push this patient uh, past uh, um, the appropriate range and into risk of OHSS. The same thing happens when to the five patients, again 0.6 of the total, that they are already between 13 and 15 M2, but that the algorithm gives them a, a 75 international unit of extra FSH. So we think because they're already at the border of 15, those, these five patients too may be pushed into OHSA's uh, risk uh, uh, territory. So for these 10 patients uh, out of 774, we may in fact uh, um, complicate treatment uh, because uh, in the face of the risk of OHSS, of course, we will have to a trigger with agonist and then go to a freeze-all situation. Um, so if we sum up everything, we can see that the algorithm could lead to a total at most of 1.2 more patients going to frozen embryo transfer because of, of risk of hyperstimulation. But this is somehow counterbalanced, I think, uh, by the fact that we are improving 10% of patients, so 10 times more patients, by bringing them into the LDL range or 
of M2. And so, in my opinion, this is a net positive in favor of the algorithm and, in fact, uh, um, something that I think warrant uh, further uh, analysis and, and perhaps implementation in clinical practice. Um, going back to the initial conversation about we need to know how the algorithm works in order to be able to understand if there are some mistakes and not just take all the association that the machine find at face value as positive. Well, you can understand from what I, I mentioned in the previous slides that we more or less know how this works because we have designed it from scratch, step by step. However, um, I would like to point out that uh, in the analysis and in the quality control, we have found that the algorithm had made a wrong assumption. Uh, basically, uh, he had found a negative correlation between the dose of FSH administered and the M2 that have been collected. This is because the algorithm have seen that uh, in some cases, uh, in response to a very high dose of FSH, very few um, M2 were collected. This we know because we work in this field. We do know that this is the case when we have a patient with a very uh, low ovarian reserve and sometimes the clinician increases the number, um, the dose of FSH in an effort to extract as many uh, uh, to recruit as many follicles as possible, knowing, of course, that they are uh, the, they are outside, you know, they're reaching the plateau and they are outside of the linear uh, range of growth. Uh, however, the algorithm doesn't know this and finds this association. If we don't check it, well, every time uh, that we want to uh, have uh, not many oocytes, the algorithm would suggest giving a very high dose. And every time that we want to have lots of oocytes, the algorithm will suggest decreasing the dose, when we in fact know that the real relationship that is proven in the majority of the range is that the higher dose of FSH correspond to more M2 recruited uh, from the ovary. So this is a very important point, and I really think it's not uh, spoken about enough. Uh, in a conversation about artificial intelligence, we must know all the time what the algorithm is doing. Otherwise, we will not be able to adjust and correct uh, some deviation that are mathematically uh, logical, but they are biologically and clinically uh, not appropriate. So the work that I've presented has been um, has been uh, uploaded into Med Archive and then uh, has been uh, reviewed and is uh, now in press in RBM Online. Um, and uh, before leaving, I would like to thank all of you for uh, listening, but also to thank all the our colleagues, contributors, and sponsors that have supported this research. Um, thank you again, and uh, see you from Barcelona. That was excellent. Uh, I'll start with some comments. Uh, that was an excellent presentation on several fronts. Uh, ARP dosing for gonadotropins has really up until now been clinical perspective. And I can tell you from our own studies here uh, that the dispersion of starting doses for very similarly matched patients with the characteristics of AMH, body mass index, age, and previous outcomes ranges anywhere these are similarly matched patients now from 150 to 300. It is all over the board. Um, one of the notes that Dr. Vicenna did not mention is the cost that it, can, it, it, it incurs if we use too much medication. And from looking at about 500 patients who um, used higher doses, we could save probably about $1.5 million. It's an incredible um, cost incurment, at least here in the United States, where the drugs can be quite expensive. Um, I'll, I'll open this up for, for comments and discussion. Uh, I think we're about to transition from very clinically expertise-driven decision-making uh, to something that's more um, algorithm-driven. And I can tell you in our own experience, we use the K-nearest neighbor as a machine learning tool. And these are very effective in identifying the, the lowest dose to maximize the outcome defining that, as Rita suggested, getting the maximum number of M2s, which hopefully will translate to the highest number of embryos. So please, questions. I'm eager to uh, hear comments. Uh, excellent question. So uh, any, qu any possibility that these tools will become a standard part of clinical guidelines? 
a delicate issue in terms of empowering clinicians to make decisions on their own, knowing the patients. Um, I, I, there are several uh, manuscripts, probably half a dozen within the past 12 months that address these issues. Um, I think what we'll find in the future is that there will be options integrated into an electronic medical record so that behind the scenes, we can get a recommendation made using a machine learning tool to identify the absolute lowest dose. And I think this will be extremely important in some clinical settings where the, the goal will be not only to get the most number of eggs, but to have absolutely a zero likelihood of ovarian uh, hyperstimulation. The other aspect of this, while I'm waiting for more questions, is ovarian stimulations are multifactorial. Uh, Rita focused on dosing of FSH, which most of the studies now have done. Uh, but as we all know, we're looking at LH suppression, whether or not oral contraceptives are used as a ramp up to the cycle, whether or not additional medications are used during the stimulation. So it's not solely FSH dose, um, but that is the real driver. Uh, one other aspect I'll mention, and then we can close. Um, the number of variables that go into identifying the ideal dose in the publications have ranged anywhere from one AMH uh, in one of the studies that we did to as many as 40. Uh, simplicity <clears throat> was always a good guide, guidepost uh, in constructing any decision tree for clinical use. Uh, I think we've yet to arrive at the absolute minimum of the most significant identifiers to give us the best dose, but I think we will have that. And I don't see any other questions. And if not, uh, we could go on and on. But I really appreciate the attendance of all of, the, all of those uh, who showed up today. I think this was an absolutely spot on excellent lecture and a good way to begin the dialogue about how we're going to quantitatively change the decision making and empower the expertise that we each bring to the clinical experience for our patients. Thanks to each of you. Thanks to Fertility for sponsoring this. And I look forward to um, connecting with each of you uh, with our next lecture in three weeks. And sincere thanks uh, to Dr. Vicenna for presenting this. And with that, we'll end. Thank you.